So, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, is Darren Gibson from uh, Manitoba. He's a research agronomist and uh, president of Gaia Consulting uh, in Newton, Manitoba. Uh, Gaia uh, conducts potato and other crop research trials, uh, contracting primarily with crop protection, fertilizer, and seed companies, as well as grower, grower organizations, processors, university, and government. Darren is a member of the Potato Association of America, uh, and the National Alliance of Independent Crop Consultants. Darren has a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the University of Manitoba and a Master of Science from North Dakota State University. And uh, I've uh, been seeing Darren around the uh, potato circuit now for probably about 10 years, and he's a very well-educated man on uh, all things crop protection particularly, uh, and uh, really looking forward to him talking to us a bit today about managing foliar pesticides in a high pressure year, kind of like we did head last year here in PEI. So take it away, Darren. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Really appreciate being here. I want to thank Ryan and, and the organizers for inviting me and, and the sponsors. Uh, very much appreciate it. So as Ryan mentioned, we do independent crop, crop uh, research in Manitoba. We've, uh, our company's been around since 1987. Uh, I joined the company in 2003, and then my wife and I bought the company in 2013. We mostly conduct potato trials, but we also work on other crops. But uh, uh, that's one of our, some of our trials there. That's actually at Tracy's site in Winkler, where we do some work with her there. And just to start with a little bit of a disclaimer, just keep in mind that uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is the situation in Manitoba, and it may not be exactly the same here on PEI. We have a different variety mix. We have dis different disease pressures, different pathogen resistance to fungicides compared to what you have here. And each of your situations are unique on your farms and uh, I want to give you some things to consider. I'm not going to tell you exactly what your program should be. It really depends on, on your situation, but uh, just keep that in mind. I'm not a pathologist, but I've con conducted an awful lot of potato fungicide trials. I usually do five to ten of them per season. I've been doing that for over 20 years. So here's a little bit of agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about Group M fungicides um, and talk about some of the leaf lesion diseases that I want to focus on early blight, brown spot, black dot, white mold, and gray mold. I'll say a little bit about biofungicides and also uh, some other considerations that you should think about. Typically in Manitoba, we're on a seven day program. Uh, the base program is weekly group M fungicides of the protectants, mancozeb and, and chlorthalonil. And then we add premium products uh, from week to week, it's different depending on uh, what pressures there are and if we need those products, but uh, for those uh, diseases that I mentioned before. And uh, we'll, in certain seasons, we need to add premium late blight products if there's late blight pressure in the area. And often growers will uh, also add phos acid to prevent pink rot and other storage diseases. So. With the group M fungicides, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but uh, with chlorthalonil, we're now reduced to three applications, and mancozeb is reduced to eight applications, and polyram has been discontinued. So we, together we have uh, those 11 applications. Group M fungicides are still, still make up the backbone of the program, and uh, I want to talk about why they're important. Firstly, multi-site uh, products in the group, group M fungicides are important for resistance management. And uh, these fungicides attack the pathogen in multiple different pathways, and that makes it uh, help with uh, pathogen resistance preventing that. So with single site products are much more prone to developing resistance in, in pathogen populations and significantly increases the, the risk. So how is resistance developed? We don't create resistance. It's naturally there in the population. And uh, we select for resistance by using these single site products. And uh, every time we apply these products, we're selecting for those uh, naturally present uh, resistant 
po uh, members of the population. And the more we use of the same group, we select more and more for those resistant populations and, and eventually they can become fully resistant. With multi-site fungicides, as I mentioned, it can target different parts of the, of the pathways. It could be spore germination, cell division, energy production, and other pathways. And when added to fungicide mixes, they improve disease control and delay the development of resistance. Chlorothalonil, I already mentioned three applications that limited supply of Bravo a few years ago, that has been resolved. So those, that product is available and I'm suggesting that you use all three of those Bravo applications or ECHO. And uh, we still have the eight Mancozeb applications. There was a few other changes to the label, re-entry period, uh, the pre-harvest interval, and also it's no longer allowed on seed. So those 11 applications, that's gonna be the main part of your program. Um, you can decide where to fit those three applications into the program, but with those 11 applications, that gets you through most seasons. Um, if you need more than 11 applications, you can add another product, but uh, these products are cost effective. They protect well against late blight and have efficacy on some of the other leaf lesion diseases that I mentioned. In a high pressure year, when, when like last year on PEI, when you have a lot of, of, of these leaf lesion diseases showing up, that's when you need to think about these other tank mix partners and where to position them. As I mentioned, late blight can be a very devastating disease. We all remember those years where we had a lot of late blight and, and uh, in the field and then later in storage. But there's many products that are available from many different groups. It's actually, although it's more devastating disease, it's in a lot of ways easier to manage with the number of frac groups that are available. And uh, so I'm gonna focus mainly on those other leaf lesion diseases. Early blight is the first one and probably the most important one we have in Manitoba. Those three photos on the left are from some of our early blight trials. And then I got a couple of Jeff Miller photos when you see some tuber lesions from early blight and uh, some very heavy early blight on, on foliage. Brown spot, I don't have photos of brown spot. Uh, I've grabbed these from, from uh, Ontario Ag and uh, Phil Wharton. And uh, the brown spot is the other alternate areas. So um, alternata is the main one. And then there's a few other species that make up that uh, small sport alternate area complex. But in my opinion, early blight and brown spot cannot really be easily distinguished visually. And I know there's lots of people who say they can distinguish early blight from, from brown spot in, on foliage. And at one time I thought that I had a pretty good idea of what one looked like more than another. But some of the work we did with Tracy at, at, in Manitoba a number of years ago really changed my mind on that. And uh, we find that, uh, and, and from some, some of Tracy's work, that uh, brown spot lesions can look like early blight, early blight lesions can look like brown spot. They can be both in the same lesion and with other pathogens there as well. So it's not as easy as, as it sounds. And uh, you can have a different ratio of those diseases depending on the season and the time of season. Yeah. So I'm gonna discuss these together as one complex. So these lesions are, as I showed in the photos, dark spots on leaf tissue with concentric rings. They, in alternating dry, wet and dry cycles are favorable for spore production and uh, it's even made worse with uh, nitrogen deficiency. So if you're low on N, and uh, have disease in the area that can really spread like wildfire in, in some of these fields. It tends to start on the lower leaves and moves up through the canopy. And uh, so when, as soon as you see some lesions on the lower leaves, it's probably time to think about considering one of, one of the premium fungicide products that, are, uh, that can uh, fight early blight. And uh, from some of Ryan's work a couple of years ago, I know they had almost all brown spot on lesions, uh, particularly late in the season. And uh, so it can really vary season by season. It looks like early blight, but it ends up being a lot of brown spot. And in Idaho, some of Jeff Miller's work, they found that uh, 
early in the season they have a lot of uh, brown spot when they, when they uh, collect leaves and do some testing. And then as the season goes on, they end up having a lot of early blight late in the season. So, but it's not the same every year. You can have more early blight early in the season. So my point is you can have both. You can have one, the other, or any combination. And uh, so you don't know what you're gonna have. So really you have to treat it as one disease and, and uh, use products the best you can to, to fight it. One thing that's important to think about with these diseases is what variety you're growing. Now you don't always have a lot of control over that, but keep in mind what variety you are growing because varieties like, uh, well, Norcoto isn't grown as much anymore for fresh market, but it's very, very susceptible. Ranger, Umatilla, Targi, Russet, Teton, Yukon Golds are all very susceptible. Um, Dakota Russet, I know it's grown quite a bit on the island here and uh, it's quite resistant to early blight, so you probably don't need as many of those expensive products on Dakota Russet as you might for sure on a Ranger. So something to keep in mind. And uh, as you're probably aware, early blight has developed reduced sensitivity or resistance to group three, group seven, group nine, group 11. In other words, all of the products that we have for, for fighting early blight and brown spot. And so that, it is why it's so important to manage resistance by alternating groups. And, and these same patterns, particularly some of the work at North Dakota State with Neil Goodmanstad and now uh, Dr. Julie Pash, she, they've been seeing that brown spot has the, the same uh, resistance to, to the same groups it develops in, in, in all those brown spot species as it does in, in the early blight. So, you have to manage resistance. It's just as important for brown spot as early blight. So another reason why, just consider them one disease complex. It's important to manage um, resistance by rotating those groups, as I mentioned, and, and uh, using a tank mix with protectant with those group M fungicides. Now, like I said before, keep in mind, I'm talking about what we are seeing in Manitoba. Uh, from what I understand, Luna Tranquility still works pretty well here on PEI, uh, the, the, the products in green I consider to be right now the best products for controlling early blight and brown spot. The yellow one's not quite as good, but at one time those were the, some of the best products. Things are changing and now Veltima, uh, Propulse or Proline Gold, Miravis Duo and Sevia are, are, are the best groups, but are the best products, but as, as you can see, we have a lot of the same groups. There's a lot of threes and sevens in there. So I'm, I'm telling you to rotate groups, but I, I recognize also that it's a challenge to do that with all of these products having a lot of threes and sevens in them. Now these products do vary in their control for some of the other leaf lesion diseases. So keep that in mind. And when you're selecting a product, think about what other diseases you have when you're selecting which one you're gonna use. And quash, I just want to mention that it's been shown to have other yield benefits. We've seen this in Manitoba in certain trials where quash, even separate from its disease control, seems to, to whatever, however it works, it, it seems to create higher yield. And Jeff Miller's seen this in Idaho. I know Ryan has looked at this on PEI and hasn't really seen that, so, so keep that in mind. Black dot is the next one I want to talk about. Now, uh, as you can see, black dot will attack just about any potato tissue. You'll find it on leaves, stems, stolons, tubers, and uh, it can be pretty devastating late in the season. Now, this isn't a disease that we have focused on a lot in the past, and whether we, it's just because we are looking at it more closely now, I think it's a combination of that, and there just is more of it in Manitoba in recent seasons. And uh, it can really take the crop down late in the season, um, particularly when it's combined with verticillium and, and other diseases going on. So it's important to consider this disease as well. It can be introduced by seed, and the sclerotia survive on plant debris in the soil. Windblown sand causes abrasions and, and gives access to the spores. And uh, so it's that sand blasting that really gets the infection going really early in, in the season when, when the plants are small. 
And, and the leaf lesions are often confused with other leaf diseases because that's another one that you can find in some of those early blight-like lesions is colitotricum can, can be in there as well. And some of the lesions do look like early blight and other things, and uh, the tuber lesions look very much like silver scurf. No variety is really considered completely resistant to black dot, so it's always, if you have blocked black dot in your area, you need to consider it in your fungicide program. These are some of the varieties that are quite susceptible and, and uh, you always need to be planning to control black dot, especially in, in Manitoba and, and in other areas. Uh, Norcota is really susceptible, Umatilla, Dark Red Norland, and Russet Burbank, we see lots of black dot in Manitoba as well. Now there's a couple different things you can do with black dot. Um, in furrow, products like Vellum Prime and Vellum Rise have some efficacy on black dot and uh, also have some efficacy against early blight foliar lesions so um, it, it, it protects very early in the season since you're putting, applying it in furrow. Uh, you should avoid following up with a group 7 because these are group 7 fungicides that you're applying in furrow so when you're following up the first foliar, like, I suggest not using group 7s at all if you can avoid it as a foliar but if, if you don't have much of a choice, at least make that first foliar something else and, and then use a group seven later if you have to. Those early foliars, that's when you need to protect against black dot because if you wait till there's been some sand blasting and those spores are already in the plants, it's, it's already happened. You're gonna be living with black dot later in the season, especially in some seasons. So you really need to think about in furrow or early foliars for black dot. Uh, Veltima, Circadus, and Quadris Top, I consider those the top products for controlling black dot. But the group 11s, I don't really even consider them early blight products anymore, but they do have a place in the program for early foliars for, for black dot. And the, the particularly why I mention those is because those best products, for, particularly Veltima, it, it works really well on early blight, and it's a 3 and 11, so it's nice to rotate with the group 7s. So if you're using it very early for black dot, um, you, you've used a, that group, and uh, you may want to save it for using for early blight. So it depends on what diseases you're more worried about and wh what your variety is more susceptible to. But keep in mind that you could use the group 11 and then, and then save those for, for early blight. Gray mold is the next one I wanted to talk about. As you can see, uh, I'm sure you see this late in the season in your crop, uh, leaf tips and leaf margins with uh, dark lesions. So it, those also have concentric rings, but they're typically larger lesions, and uh, as you saw in the previous photo, and lesions are limited by major veins, particularly bad in wet years and develops on, on lower leaves when the rows are closed. So w when you get that canopy and it's moist under there, that's when those develop, persists on dead and dying material. And uh, most varieties have some level of susceptibility. And we don't really think of it as a, as a big yield robber in, in Manitoba. And I was talking to Jeff Miller in Idaho and he doesn't really consider it as, as, as a huge problem that he worries about for, for losing yield. But some varieties that are really susceptible and I, I know from talking to some folks here that uh, Dakota Russet can really be hammered by, by gray mold here on PEI in some seasons, so it's something to consider when you're looking at gray mold. For management, here's the products that, that, that work particularly well on, on gray mold. Luna Tranquility, Scala, Miravis Duo, and I've, I've listed Bravo there particularly because in your base program for protectants through the season, those three applications you have of chlorthalonil, you may want to position those in, when you feel you're more vulnerable to gray mold because Bravo is a little better than Mancozeb for, for gray mold protection, protection. So something to keep in mind. In Agronomus in Manitoba, they, there's uh, some of them in that position, the chlorothalonil apps uh, mid-season to, to uh, protect against gray mold. Scala is 
I wanted to mention that it's not registered in Canada for gray mold on potato, but it is in the United States and on tomato in Canada. And that's more because they did not submit data for gray mold when they were applying for the label. So it's not that it doesn't work well, but it isn't registered currently. But if you're targeting early blight with Scala later in the season, and, it, and it's a good rotation product, this is a group nine, it's not a group seven, so it's good to rotate with. And it, when you're targeting early blight, it'll also help with gray mold. White mold is the next one I wanted to talk about. It survives in the soil as sclerotia. It infects beans, mustard, canola, and other, several other plant species. Uh, the sclerotia germinate under moist conditions, particularly in high rainfall areas or under center, center pivot irrigation to form apothecia, which ejects spores onto the land on senescing flower petals. This is seen more in rotations that include soybean and brassicas. If you, so if you, if you have canola, soybeans and potatoes in your rotation, those are all susceptible to white mold. So you could be building up disease and, and it's something you need to be aware of and plan to control. Um, in Idaho, they've seen where sequential applications of protectant fungicides, particularly clorthalonil, like, because down there they have uh, full, they can do use full season uh, of clorthalonil. So if when they do that, they've seen that white mold, white mold is even made worse by that. But uh, in, in Canada, we only have three applications, so it's not really much of a concern. But you should spray preventatively for white mold with first application being at, at full bloom when those flower petals are about to start dropping and again 14 days later. I'm listing, there's several varieties there that are, uh, that are quite susceptible including some that you grow here and uh, white mold isn't a particular problem in Manitoba but can be in, in high rainfall years out this way and uh, in the Pacific Northwest it's a problem under very high um, irrigation regimes. For white mold management, I'm, I'm really going a lot um, based on Jeff Miller's research in Idaho. He does a lot of white mold work. As I said, we don't get a lot of white mold in Manitoba and uh, I haven't even had, I've attempted to do a white mold trial, but we just don't have enough pressure for it, so that tells you that it, we don't focus on it much in Manitoba. But those are the products that work well. Uh, one I wanted to point out is Allegro because it's group 29, so it's nice to not use another group seven uh, when you're targeting white mold, so you can rotate better. And Allegro also protects against late blight, so you may want to use Allegro, a couple apps of Allegro, when you're concerned about white mold and then you still have the other groups for, for early blight or brown spot. So as I mentioned before, infrared fungicides can affect your folio program. So if you're using vellum rise, um, that should say vellum prime or vellum rise infrared, keep that in mind because that could affect your folio program and what you need to do there. So the, those vellum products are control fungi, their fungicides and their nematicides, and they suppress early blight and black dot. And a, in a low pressure season, it could even be season long protection for early blight. But if you have higher pressure, then you need to rotate with other products. And as I said, try not to use a group seven. And if you have to, don't use it in the first foliar. I want to talk about biofungicides. This is becoming a bigger and bigger thing where biologicals are becoming more and more important. We're starting to test these for various companies and I can't give you any details on those, but we are looking at them more and more. They control or, or at least suppress potato diseases and often that's through the induction of host plant defenses and they reduce the amount of active ingredient potentially by replacing conventional applications and they can be used in, in, in mixes, tang mixes or premixes. And I see this as being, something's gonna happen more and more in the future. There's a few products that I've listed here that are already registered. 
but we're actually testing products that are premixes with biologicals and conventionals in the same product. And I think all the companies are looking at these things and there's a lot of pressure to use less active ingredient or, or less harmful products. And so I, th I think we're gonna see more and more of this. So just to summarize, things that I want you to think about for your fungicide program is, is to consider what the most important diseases that, that you deal with that affect yield and quality. So and when you're thinking about what variety you're gonna grow, what is the susceptibility of that variety to the diseases that you normally see? Think about the maturity of your variety. If it's a really short season variety, uh, early market, fresh, that you're gonna kill in end of July or early August. I've, I've seen in Manitoba where somebody has a short season variety like a dark red Norlin and they're putting on three or four expensive premium products and it, it's, you're not gonna benefit from that when you're harvesting it that early. It's just, there isn't enough time for it to make a difference in yield. Select a fungicide that has efficacy against your, your most, most important disease. And if you have two ones that are fairly equal in the control of that disease, and they're similarly priced and they're in the same group, then think about what other diseases they control. So if, it's, uh, if they're both good early blight products, if you have problems with uh, black dot, then, then consider that. If you have white mold, uh, consider that. So when you're selecting those. Plan your fungicide program now. Like all the uh, manufacturers are here at the show. Talk to them about what they have for products, what, what uh, diseases they control, and uh, plan your program for the season, but also put some uh, thought into what you may change in season if you have a higher pressure situation where you need to add different products or to control diseases as they come up. Make sure you rotate groups and make sure the products, you, you either have them or you know you can get them. Consider the inferro fungicides. I've mentioned that a couple of times. And, and only consider fungicides that are on your buyer's approved list. If you're, if you're growing for Cavendish, make sure that the products that you're applying are allowed to be applied. Even though a product is registered in Canada, if it's not a tolerance for it or an MR, uh, MRL in the country that the crop could be marketed to, you can't use it. Make sure you read the label and understand it. Talk to experts in your area rather than trust labels because as I mentioned before, when these products were registered, they worked great on, 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 all, on the diseases they're registered for, but as resistance develops, Sometimes they become not a good product for those diseases and it's still on the label. So you, you don't just read the label, you, you talk to people, make sure you understand what still works. Pre-harvest intervals, they can be a day, they can be 14 days or longer. Make sure you're not applying within that period. Consider the rate range, lower rates for lower pressure, higher rates for higher pressure for some products. Don't exceed the maximum seasonal rate and don't exceed the number of maximum applications. And things not to consider is uh, relationships with companies alone and, and only using products from one company. They might not have the groups you need to rotate to, so it's important to have everything available to you. Don't think about what the neighbors are spraying or what money you've already spent or what products you have too much of. <laughs> Fungicide programs can be complicated in a high pressure year. I think we all know that. And uh, make sure they all work together and the products are allowed and you're managing resistance and plan ahead of time. And remember, if it was easy, everyone would do it. So that's, that's you folks work hard to grow a good crop and uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, you think of these things. And if anybody had any questions and if, if we're long, I can, yeah, then, but if anybody has any questions, then I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? Rodrigo, we've got the, the catch box. This is our summer crew here from this past <laughs> summer. Um, our, our daughters are there as well, the, the, the ones with the glasses. 
I guess I have two questions for you up here. Okay. Oh, hi. Um, earlier on in your presentation, you mentioned something about Mechazeb or Manzate not allowed on seed, or did I hear that wrong? It's just after I got here. Yeah, that use has been uh, taken away. Uh, isn't that right, Tracy? It's, so it's uh, no longer used as a as a dust on seed. Oh, okay, yeah. as a dust on seed, yeah. cutting seed, yes. Right. Not applications for foliar. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's it's uh, we still have eight applications as a foliar. It's just no longer allowed on other crops. It, it's really only potatoes now, it's, and and it's uh, no longer used as as a seed treatment. Okay. The other question I had was on the vellum prime rise and stuff, and this is more maybe directed a little bit at you, Ryan. Are we seeing any any uh, good effects on that in Dakotas or Targhees or Rangers or any varieties here where people have tried that and uh, being able to not have so much pressure on some of the other Lunas or Maravis do or any of those. I'm just curious. I hadn't really thought of that as, as an option yet. What, well, are, what are you for, seeing? First, I'll comment before for Ryan does, but uh, the, the, this is a group seven, and uh, just keep in mind that uh, um, Luna and, and uh, Miravis are both have a group seven in there as well, so uh, you, be careful of that and, and especially not use those as your first foliar if you've used the uh, vellum in furrow. But Ryan, what have you been seeing? I can't really say a whole lot more than that. I would just say uh, like Luna and vellum had the same product in them, right? So it's just that, yeah. that is, and especially when we're talking about resistance and that sort of thing, just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, I think some people have been saying that they're getting along quite well here with those products, um, but I think it's important to say that we're rotating and, and trying other products as well. This year with, in AIM, we are looking at doing uh, a resistance project for early blight and brown spot, um, pro hopefully working with Rick Peters and, and Julie Pashi out at North Dakota State. So we're, li we're likely gonna be collecting some foliar samples this year for trying to assess where we're at on the resistance side with some of these products. Thanks, Ryan. And Anybody else have questions? Okay. If not, we're going to continue the Manitoba section of the program. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, okay thanks. thanks a lot. Thanks.